Welcome to Energy Innovations, a regular video series that explores the latest innovations in technology, digital, regulations, products, services, finance, and business models that are impacting the energy sector. Energy Innovations interviews entrepreneurs, energy companies, capital markets, and regulators to understand how the energy industry is changing. Welcome back to Energy Innovations. And uh, today I want to dig into the changes that are happening in the education system in response to the pressures that are facing the energy industry. One of the realities that we're in is that if we do not have the resources in terms of trained professionals to work on not only the legacy infrastructure that we currently have in place, but also the new infrastructure we intend to build, uh, our efforts to drive things like energy diversification are going to fail, or certainly they will struggle. And as part of that conversation, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Jim Gibson to the conversation. Jim is the chief catalyst at SAIT, uh, which is an education system, uh, education uh, institution based in Calgary, Alberta, but with worldwide operations. I've had the occasion to work with uh, SAIT uh, internationally. Jim, welcome to Energy Innovations. Pleasure to be here, Jeffrey. Thanks for having me. Now, you have an interesting background in your own right. You're a published author and te uh, tech entrepreneur, um, and uh, but now you find yourself in this really interesting role with uh, with SAIT. I wonder if you could just unpack the role for me, please. What What is it? What's within your mandate and your remit, and what are you focusing on there? So, you know, you can imagine with a title, Chief Catalyst, that 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 it's it's a uh, it's a lot of fun and 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 really quite innovative. And I and I give I give the SAIT team and, and the board of governors and, and the executive team a lot of credit for being bold and in, in, in creating a, a title like chief catalyst and 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 it does work and play on the exact definition of what a catalyst is which is this idea of, of increasing the rate of change of a, of a reaction um, without itself changing as, as it says but but the catalyst role is really to go across the institutions of SAIT so SAIT as you may know has eight or nine different schools um, and, and each of which ha are very, very successful in their own right. But the chief catalyst role is to really take a look at the future and say, what is it about digital transformation that makes sense to introduce in, in a meaningful, um, demonstrable way to create meaningful student experiences uh, across the board? But m I think most importantly, the role of the chief catalyst is to create collisions amongst the schools, is to, to get out of the the silos of, 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 of the world that we generally see ourselves in and really understand that digital transformation actually cuts across the silos. And that's where I think my, my background and experience as a, as a venture person and an entrepreneur, I, I look for those kinds of synergies and connection points. So it's a great opportunity at this point in my, in my, in my career. I've built a, a fantastic team and, uh, you know, a big shout out to the team at SAIT for, you know, being bold enough and courageous enough to try. Now, what are the si the kinds of um, industrial issues that would that would propel a, a state or any educational institution to want to do things like cut across the the uh, the the schools themselves to create these kinds of collisions? What's what's driving this? I think I think I think it, if you go to the heart of what digital is, is that digital creates this what we call this 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 this, this spirit of abundance is that as I look across business process, I can start to look at the abundant way in which um, I, I can make things happen in different ways. So for example, when, when we're talking about the school of energy in transition, the abundant thinking says, well, we're going to be creating net new things. We're going to be creating net new opportunities and jobs and, and so forth, not only in the existing uh, entities, but also in literally brand new. Well that's a perfect opportunity for work with our school of business, or it's a perfect opportunity to work with our school of advanced digital technology and cybersecurity, for example. And so the drivers that we're seeing is that as digital starts to move into disrupt existing industries, we need some of the basics and some of the experiences of everything from business to automation to, um, to the advanced digital technology. And we need to fuse those together with those who really understand the domain. And so you get this wonderful mashup of, of both uh, domain expertise, both current and future, but also some of the skills that will propel it. 
So yeah, it's a, I, I feel it every day, Jeffrey. Yeah, it's an exciting time, exactly. Can you give me some examples of of how, uh, say, the uh, the schools? Uh, if I go, if you roll the tape back just uh, two or three years, how would the schools and and the educational institutions normally respond to change that happens in society that in turn drives the demand for different professional skills in the school system? Uh, because I, uh, my sense is that the, the digital is changing so fast that there's a misalignment here traditionally between how schools react and prepare for the future versus how they now have to react and prepare. And that's that difference that I think gives rise to this interesting catalyst role that you're in. Super, super, super com um, comment, Jeff Jeffrey. I, I think that um, as, as we look at the traditional model is is I'm a school, I'm the dean and my academic chairs. And you know, the, the most important thing I can do, especially for a polytechnic like say, is to reach out to industry, is to have industry advisory committees, program advisory committees, and so forth. But the cadence of that is, you know, in, in the past, you know, was once a year or twice a year, and 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 that was generally enough that that a good group of advisors, both again at the strategic you know, um, school level or at a program level, that was good enough. And so you you would assemble a group of really smart folks from industry, and you'd you'd have that conversation and say, are we on track? What's missing? What are the gaps? And so forth. Well, that just doesn't apply in a in a in a world of of of, of, of half lives of knowledge in in the months and years versus decades. And so, so one of the things that that you know that we're starting to see is this more continuous connection with industry. And that's a really that's that's a profound change. Is how do you create those conversations, where you're both leading you're 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 leading industry, but you're also led by industry. So this this idea of uh, co-creation and collaboration is really essential. But the cadence is starting to pick up, and that creates that creates logistical challenges. It's it's not it's not. Uh, no, it's not the same for every school. So but I think that's the one one thing is this notion of the timeliness of the conversations that we need to have. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's picking up. And and if what is industry telling you by way of call it um, gaps or places where you know they're they're saying we are short this kind of skill set and um, and uh, which if you could be provide some guidance to if there's young people listening to this. What, what is it that industry is telling you? For instance, I hear, hey, we need uh, more data scientists as one example. But, you know, surely it's a bigger problem than, than just having some more, um, some more data scientists out there. Well said. And, and, and let, me, let me throw up, you know, the framework that we're using in, in, our, in our transformation model is, is really it's, it's, there's three types of skills or three types of things that industry is asking us for. Number one is this, the idea of students that are aware. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, when we talk about horizon one, two, and three in, in the McKinsey model of the world of what's coming over the horizon, you know, at, at minimum, we need our students to be aware of what's coming at them and, and actually our faculty as well. We need them to understand that digital is creating an, a need to understand some interesting new business models, new, new technologies and so forth. So we need to awareness, that's number one. The second is, is something that, that we're hearing from industry is mindset, is this idea that, that, you know, and I think it's obvious is there is a collection of, of essential competencies that we need to have that really are focused on the human aspect, not the, not the technical aspect, the human aspect, critical and design thinking, um, um, essential competencies such as that that help students have a mindset for lifelong learning, for being in a, in a world of, you know, the VUCA world, the volatility, uncertainty world. Um, and so that we're being asked for. And then finally, um, the skills, you know, those, the skills of, of the traditional oil and gas industry, for example, in our McPhail School of Energy are shifting to, you know, redesigning and rethinking around what are the skills necessary for sustainable energy or, or, and, and what are those in transition? So, you know, just to repeat, the it's it's awareness, mindset, and skills is the way we look at uh, what industry is talking to us about. Yeah, yeah. This is a I think a critical found, finding of my own work in the industry is is what I characterize as a kind of a frozen middle 
of inability to move forward. And, and uh, it starts with awareness. If you just don't understand what's, what uh, the arts of the possible is, what's coming at you, it's very hard to mobilize an organization to want to change. Now, there are some, some specific uh, collisions or convergences which are really fascinating. I'm, I wonder if you could comment, for example, on how, say, the financial technology world, fintech, and for there we could talk about Bitcoin or other uh, uh, currencies, although it's, it's much richer and deeper than that. Payment systems, another example. How, how this collides with an energy industry portfolio or energy education program, which is just teaching young people and professionals how the energy system works. Th these, these convergences now are opening up new playground. How do you, how do you re factor that into your, your, into your thinking around the, uh, the, the educational shift that has to take place here? I think you picked, I think you picked probably one of the best examples that, that, you know, to the average, you know, to the average person, they go, well, why would that connect? But Jeffrey, I think you picked the, the perfect one. So if you unpack FinTech, DeFi and, and distributed finance, Web3, blockchain, you know, you start to understand um, what happens when you have distributed um, uh, governance models, distributed ways of moving, moving both, not only, not only finance, that's, that's very important, the ability to have distributed um, authentication around around uh, around currencies, if you will, everything from Bitcoin and beyond. But it's actually the 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 governance models that are really starting to move. So as I start to decentralize and unpack systems, including energy, you have to have systems of trust, and you have to have systems of scalable uh, uh, transaction management. And so, you know, the finance fintech is really teaching us about how you unpack that value. And, and so the skills that we need to understand around how we do everything from distributed blockchain concepts, but also through to security and privacy and those kinds of things. As you start to unpack the value chain of energy, well, you have to start connecting that back up. And the only way you can do that if you're going to pull apart that business model is you have to have systems like that, that are starting to emerge out of, out of, out of uh, distributed uh, finance web three. So I, I think you picked a perfect example that as we learn more about finance and we learn about how we create distributed models, I think they apply directly to how we create sustainable energy systems. So I, excellent example. Well, I think we, we just could dig, have, yeah, we, we could dig into a number of these things because I think industrial automation is another example of where there is a, a world of oh robotics. Goodness. Yeah, a world of robotics and uh, uh, automation of um the the uh, fit, what would typically be called manual labor, manual work, and then tying that into industrial plant operation, which is uh, you know th these are are coming together as well. So I mean this is not just fintech; it's easy to po point at fintech, but there's so many other examples. And those collisions are, are as we discussed at the beginning, yeah. are the real interesting. You know, as I like as I said in my first book was. You know, the most interesting things in any system are at the intersection when things collide. That's where all the, you know, the, we talk about natural systems when the river hits the ocean. That's <laughs> actually where the tidal pools are formed and actually where the, the real life is. And so when I look at, you know, what you just described as new energy systems meet distributed finance, meet industrial automation, meet cybersecurity. Well, you just talked about four schools at stake. Yeah, throw in the hospitality school, and then we maybe may have breakfast over it. But, but you know, so, so. <laughs> yeah, it gets they, they get it mixed together. Uh, to what degree does this shift that, that you're that's you know you're you're kind of working your way through? To what degrees does it spill over into uh, more mundane things like facilities? Like you know, the the typically in these schools, you know, they're uh, they're they 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 have their own. Uh, requirement for training um, uh, uh, talent, and if I think about a you know a school of science, I can imagine a lab uh, where students get to work with lab equipment. Uh, if I imagine a business school, I imagine uh, that it's uh, uh, opportunity for uh, students to ex um, study and experiment with, say, some kinds of um, supply chain tools. To what degree does the shift that you're working your way through, and you can see the education system having to deal with, how does it come into the facilities world? and drive facility shift or changes in how you even allocate facility resources to schools? Um, great, great question. I, I, think, I think it's 
as you start to as you start to um, to pull apart these systems and virtualize them, you start to create the ability to create um, experimental places of, of of interaction with students um, that can happen not only in the virtual world but can happen anywhere in the world. So you can start connecting students and projects and information across the world. So as we look at digital twinning, as we look at virtual lab environments, as we start to look at the things that connect us, what I call the future of presence, of how we present and are present in, in ways, they're getting extraordinarily sophisticated. So when you start looking at and unpacking the XR world, the extent, you know, mixed reality, AR, VR, and you start looking at how you can apply experimental labs and environments, you start to look at facilities in a whole different way. You start to look at, at, at what is the space requirements that are needed. But more importantly, um, as our, you know, our VP of academic is, is so fond of saying, is, is build, you know, Jim, build me something that I can repurpose for anything, not just a lab that does water experiments or, or large industrial experimentation for automation, but it can also be flipped over and, and, and be recreated for something that's entirely different. And so I think it really pushes our facilities team to think very differently. And, and, and I, I'm, I, we're quite close with our facilities team in terms of the work that we're doing in, in creating the digital infrastructure that enables this high bandwidth you know, opportunities. But to think beyond the local campus, like think beyond just you know, wiring up a smart campus up on the hill, exactly. but to create those connection points to places all over the world. And that gets really exciting. Well, and, and but, it, but it raises another dimension here, which is to the degree to which the educational systems themselves virtualize as they've been forced to do during the pandemic is also opening up a much bigger landscape for the, for the educational to, institutions to operate. You know, once you go virtual, you are in essence global. And uh, so you're no longer tied to necessarily the physical uh, single place infrastructure and the learning methods of the past. You can actually go broader. How is this factoring into uh, the thinking around the educational institutions and, and uh, what, the, what the future might hold? So good news and, you know, good news. We, we, we can connect anywhere in the world and our student, our, our client, our student population is global. Yeah. Bad news, I'm competing against Stanford. Precisely. You know, so, exactly. so, so I think it ups our game. I think, so two things that I would respond with my SATE hat firmly on rather than a generic education. I, I really, I really feel strongly that, that the applied model that, 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 that the polytechnics are, are famous for is really going to be relevant here. So the contextual applied opportunities for global problem solving all of a sudden play right into the favor of those who can create those experiments and interactions with local industry really well. So I think, I think, you know, I've been looking at this very carefully as we think about transformation. And I, and I love that model of, of kind of global access, but local experimentation and local connectivity. To it. And so I think, I think work integrated learning that, you know, that's an old term, but boy, oh boy, is it ever starting to come become interesting as we start to apply, you know, virtualized lab environments, uh, extended uh, uh, student experiences from anywhere. So I think that Jeffrey, I think that's where, you know, I'm quite interested in, in where does applied education start to move as we start to create the ability to experiment anytime, anywhere. And I get, I get, I think that gets me really excited. Yeah, that's a very powerful concept, actually, uh, the uh, anytime, anywhere. I, I, for instance, have a training course on uh, Udemy. This is just a series of video lectures. Right. And you know, 2,500 people have taken the thing all around the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite startling, actually, to field <laughs> correspondence from, you know, India and Pakistan and Kyrgyzstan where someone's taking the course. And uh, so I, I definitely find myself at a kind of a world scale um, a bit unexpectedly. Let's turn to this question of the ecosystem uh, because, you know, you can't do this on your own. It, it, it's, the world's changing too fast. The technologies are evolving very, very quickly. Uh, in your capacity as a catalyst, is one of the catalytic elements you're pulling into the transformation of the education system in favor of, uh, of um, this adoption of digital, uh, an engagement with an ecosystem out there that is, is, uh, is also in, in part of this transformation program? Maybe you could unpack a little bit that question. How, how do you deal with, with that ecosystem? 
I love that question because I think you know, you know, part of my background, I come from from an ecosystem world, right? We yeah. we we built we built the the concept of the rainforest movement, which was the connective tissue in an ecosystem uh, of innovation, and and how do you how do you make that happen? And and so you know, one of the things you know, without getting too out there, Jeffrey, but but and it's something that I'm very passionate about, is that is that ecosystems matter. Transparency matters, but to make all of that happen quickly and effectively, you need a culture of trust. And what I mean by that is you need to be able to feel confident that as I open up my world as a as an as an industrial partner or, or a corporate partner, is that I have a you know I have the ability to to trust and and move quickly with an educational institution in, in terms of ownership of, of IP, in terms of sharing of things. And so all of a sudden, if we're going to move fast, I have an expression that says trust equals velocity. And velocity is the only way that we're gonna make, uh, you know, align to the speed of digital transformation. And so, you know, ecosystem thinking is at the center of this. You can't be an institution on the hill. You can't be the, the siloed world of, of, of my school versus your school, or even my, my individual department versus yours. The only way this will work is that if we start to move quickly between those, those elements. And so that begins with being very transparent and very open with the ecosystem in, in which you're working. So coming back to your early question about how some of the changes have happened, I'm looking at the advisory committees and how we do those kinds of things. We need to be very, very transparent and much more, much, much, uh, much rapid pace in that in that world, because we need to share more. We just we just do. And you know, I, I come from the technical world, so iteration and agile is my middle name. And so those principles are not lost. So we, you know, we have to stop thinking we need to get it perfect the first time. We need to have that culture of trust that says, hey, let's experiment here. Let's try something different. It doesn't work. Let's call it a day and, and let's let's but let's learn and iterate, but let's fail fast. And and I mean that quite sincerely. And that's not easy. Not I'm easy. Sure. <laughs> the world of scarcity in academia and post-secondaries and so forth. So, anyways. I'll stop there. I can go on and on about ecosystems. Yeah, they're very, very important. They, uh, in a just a very simple level, the school itself uh, will play a role, I'm sure, in helping with the development of technologies such as uh, augmented mm -hmm. reality and virtual reality. But you're also dependent on the hardware manufacturers who make this stuff, and they're iterating their products every six months. If you want to be a like at the edge of, of supporting industry, you're going to have to tie into these companies and figure out ways to uh, get access to what's going on in their labs. And so your, your point about the ecosystem is not lost. It is, it is vitally important. And I think that's one of my roles. I mean, if I look at the catalyst role as really starting initially with the, within the, within the institution and looking, but I think one of my, my, my key roles, and I think part of the reason why I was hired was my connectivity to, to, to that, to the, to the players in the yeah, industry. Exactly. And I'm a curator, you know, I think, you know, catalytic and curation of what's what's important, what's real, what makes sense. And I, I take that I take that piece very serious. Yeah, it is critical. What kind of stories do you tell when you're engaging with, say, an industrial executive in Calgary or Edmonton or anywhere in the world in more virtual? What stories do you tell about the kinds of innovations happening in the school that uh, you feel um, paint the picture for these executives to get it, that, 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 that the education systems are moving, that they're transforming, and that they're going to be there when industry says, hey, we need, we need more people who know this. What, what, how, how, do you, how do you show them and tell them that uh, things are, are moving and things are happening? Um, a bunch of ways, but I think the one I would focus on, Jeffrey, is, is and again, with my safe hat firmly on, is is the ability for us and and the the opportunity for us to do very meaningful work integrated learning uh, uh, projects and 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 connection points. So so when when we talk to the industry executives, they need to know that 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 the students not only have the as they have the skills, but they've actually worked on meaningful opportunities that can bring them into the workforce and the labor force much more quickly. And so one of the big worries that you have is, 
is that a, a student who's involved in, in, you know, say a two, three year diploma or degree moving through, but is, is then hits the workforce unready because the pace of change is critical. And so you have to, so the, the message we try and deliver to industry executives is, is you're getting students who are actually touching real world, world problems in meaningful ways. And I think that, 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 that allays a bit of the fears of, well, I'm going to bring somebody in and then I'm going to have to spend six months or you know eight months training them. And so our job is to really bridge that gap to make sure that we're not, we're not creating this, this, this you know, incomplete uh, contributor to their workforce that we've actually had some time to work with them in, in real, real job related. So capstones, work integrated learning, apprenticeships, or all those kinds of things. One of the things that our School for Advanced Digital Technology just stood up was a brand new um, apprentice model in cybersecurity. So think about apprenticeship, but now bring it to what has traditionally been a you know a digital, you know, skill-based training, but actually combine that as an apprentice model in cybersecurity. Well, that's really cool because cybersecurity is changing so fast. Yeah, that you need to be able to be right there. Anyway, so, so that's 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 what I think that that we're starting to we're starting to see. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating example, actually, because it you would not normally think of apprenticeship uh, yeah. and intellectual property in the same fashion, Correct. right? Correct. You think about that's apprenticeship. A, that's a mind. That's a break. That that's a real break in in an old in in the old model. So yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a break. And then the, there's all kinds of nuances lurking in there. Like, will the young person you bring on board uh, maintain the same level of uh, privacy and sensitivity to the work that they're doing? Because it's, you know, in cyber, it's going to be deeply, deeply sensitive areas if, if you get hacked or you're subject to ransomware. So, you know, your, your, the, the level of, I mean, back to one of your earlier words you used, level of trust that you have to have with the resources that you're bringing on board, that they're able to, uh, uh, you know, participate in the model that you're working with is, is very, very strong. So that's fascinating. Uh, Jim, uh, let me just turn to a kind of final closing thoughts. Where do you see the school and the school system headed uh, down the road in, in this regard? Where, where is the innovation on horizon two, horizon three, uh, as regards to energy that you are uh, cur currently anticipating? Well, I think, I think number one is, is uh, my, my deep belief in horizon one or two, but, but certainly in, in the future, is that sustainable energy, the, the systems that are going to drive our, the transition of, of our current energy systems into the, into the world, our future, are going to be digital. And so what, what that means is, is if we're going to understand the impact of everything from the, the true cost of energy impact and all the way through to new systems of design, new systems of energy, it really is a digital conversation. What, what that means is that we need to understand, number one, we need to understand the role of data and, and, and how that applies. And it's, and it's obvious corollary, which is and, and follow on, which is AI and ML. And so if in order for us to create the sustainable energy systems, we're really gonna have to unpack their impact and understand what 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 those systems mean, and that's a data. That's a that's absolutely a, a data challenge. So what we want to start thinking about is in in our school is where does data literacy and data intelligence and digital intelligence apply from a data perspective across all the programs. So that's number one. I think that's essential to understanding the future of sustainable energy. So that's, that's that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. And then the second is is and and this is a completely the other way, which is the the systems of energy are being changed all over the world and there's we're, we're not alone you know, while we happen to have a significant portion of our gdp in in that business the energy systems of the planet are changing and we need to be connected to those so the future of education is not about what happens in calgary it's what's happened in the in the planet these are not small systems these are wicked problems in big, complex, global systems. And so what are we doing from an international perspective to make the education system transparent, open, and collaborative? Co-creation of models of, of sustainable energy, I think, is, is essential. We started a program um, that we're going to be 
adding to called How to Change the World, which came out of the University College London, out of UCL in London, England. Mm -hmm. And it was a required capstone course for all 17 of the undergrad courses at UCL. And what it was, it was, was, was five to seven people teamed from multiple disciplinary solving UNSGG problems. Wow. And, and, and so the trick there, though, and we brought them into SAID in a pilot project in this last year. The critical thing in our education system is we have to fall in love with the problems, not just the solution. So we have to really teach people how to really unpack what is the actual problem. What's the real problem? And so how to change the world taught us a lot about some of those, those ways of working. So, you know, horizon two, you know, on the one hand, on the, on the, on the pure digital side, it's going to be about data. It's going to be about machine learning and energy systems. Yeah. Yeah. On the other side, on the human side, innovation of ways, it's about creating multidisciplinary approaches on an international global scale. Yeah. It's a very exciting time, Jim. Thank you so much for coming on energy innovations today. If people want to learn more about, the programs at SAIT and what SAIT's actually doing, where do they go? What's the website? It's the easiest way to go is uh, SAIT.ca and uh, follow the links, as they say. So yeah. there's lots going on. The McPhail School of Energy, stay tuned for some very interesting announcements coming out of there. Um, but uh, you can hear all about that at SAIT.ca. Fantastic. Jim, thanks so much for coming on Energy Innovations today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Jeff. This has been another episode of Energy Innovations. If you like what you've seen, by all means, press the like button, leave a comment, or share this with your network, and we'll return shortly with another episode. Bye for now. Thanks for joining our latest interview on Energy Innovations from Energy Now Media. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and share this video. You can contact us at info at to book your appearance or to become a sponsor.